today when you walked in, you got uh, Lord's Supper. I don't know what to call it, man. It's like a combo pack, right? And <clears throat> just hold on to that because we're in our series called Drawing Near. And um, if you're new with us today, let me just give you a quick idea of where we've been because I feel like I've got a lot that I want to communicate in a short amount of time. And so um, if, you're, if you're visiting, thanks for hanging out with us today. Uh, my name is Brian, and we're in a series called Drawing Near, and it answers the question, how do you draw near to God? And if, if, you're, um, if you're not close to God, if you're not a follower, not a believer, and you're hanging out with us today for some different reason, I'm especially glad that you're here um, Sometimes God can seem like just that constantly angry person, you know. If you have been with us, then you know we've been going through Leviticus. And Leviticus is that book in the Bible that it's like when I tell people I'm preaching through Leviticus, they think I'm joking and they laugh. And they're like, oh, that's a fun. who would ever be so crazy to go through Leviticus, you know. But we've seen a lot of truth in it. And today in particular is something that it's a little different and... Um, we have already sung, it's already been wonderful, the worship. We've already heard truth and said truth to God, and that's what these songs are. Uh, we've already seen a, a, a beautiful picture of baptism. But we're also doing something that involved these little combo packs, these little, uh, and we call it Lord's Supper. And so the question becomes, and it was funny because my assistant and I were talking this week like, hey, we're going to do Lord's Supper from Leviticus. And we both started laughing, right? Like, how do you talk about Jesus and the Lord's Supper from Leviticus? And I was like, we can do it, you know? And we can because, quite frankly, Jesus himself did. Jesus had that final supper with his followers, and he's referring to Leviticus. And so the question that I want to ask you as we're kind of thinking through this, very simple question. If, if the Bible is so fiercely clear that you are not to consume the blood of anything. You are not to drink blood, consume blood. I mean, the Bible is so clear, says in different passages, the life is in the blood, so blood represents life. The Bible is so clear that blood belongs to God. When the animals were sacrificed throughout uh, Leviticus, as we've gone through several chapters now, they did not take the blood and drink it. And one of the reasons was, I guess one, it's gross, but another reason was, it was commanded not to. I mean, God made it incredibly clear. You shall not consume blood. You shall not drink blood. He even said, if any of you were to consume blood, drink blood, he is to be cut off from my people. Like, you are not my people anymore. Don't even come around the people of Israel, the people of God. You're done. It was like capital punishment. They wanted, I mean, God was very clear. That blood is mine. It represents life. And when the animal would be sacrificed, they would capture the blood in a basin and pour it out. Now, that did not include the blood that would have been sprinkled on the altar and sprinkled everywhere else, but it was like, we're gonna put the rest of this blood into the ground, like it's going back to God. It's his, and he's like, it's mine. So all those things being true, why did Jesus said, unless you drink my blood, you're not with me? Right? Because we're saying Jesus is the son of God. We're saying Jesus is a member of the Trinitarian God. We're saying Jesus is the Word made flesh, and Jesus said, unless you drink my blood, you have no part with me. I'll tell you what, before we answer that question, we'll come back to that, because I wanted to kind of linger in your brain for a minute. I remember when I was a kid, like elementary school, and there would be these church Function, or uh, school functions. And I remember, you know, the kids would come up on stage, you know, like in the auditorium or something, and maybe they're going to sing. I don't know. Whatever. And I remember being there and the whole crowd ahead of me, but there was really only one thing I was looking for. Were my parents there? Right? So I'm, I'm among all of my classmates about to sing some song, I guess. And I remember just looking and scanning the crowd. I didn't care that everyone else was there. I didn't. I didn't, I didn't even sort of notice if anyone else was there. It didn't matter. But as soon as I caught the eyes of my parents, it was like, right? I mean, 
all I want, like the performance was secondary. Their presence was what was important. What happens to us between childhood and adulthood where we're no longer excited by the notion that God is constantly there watching? How did we get to a point where we, we feel like his ever-present gaze is a threat? What happened to us? The whole point of the Christian life, like the essence of the Christian life, it's like it's the goal of the Christian life, is that we come to a place where we are so excited to realize that there's no way we can run from the presence of God. There's nowhere we can hide from his constant peering into our life. And our goal should be that that makes us so excited. Uh, King David wrote about this. There's a psalm, Psalm 56, I'll, I'll read it to you. And in the last verse of Psalm 56, he said, for you have delivered my soul from death, indeed my feet from stumbling, so that I may walk before God in the light of the living. Like he's excited to say that I may walk before God in the light of the living. I'm so excited to write this that I can walk in such a way before you, God, before God. And this was, this was what sort of turned into this great concept called Coram Deo. And I want to I wanna show you that. Coram Deo there was, was this uh, belief, this system, this understanding that we always get to walk before God. We are always walking in the presence of God, in the view of God, in the, under the authority of God, uh, under the uh, pres- or power and presence. Like it was this always, Coram is before Deo is God. That should be pretty simple. And this, was, this is the Latin, Coram Deo is Latin of before God, where it says in Psalm uh, 56, 13, that I may walk before God. This is walk Coram Deo. It's fourth century Latin that the Catholic Church often still uses what's called the Latin Vulgate. The idea was it's exciting to walk in the presence and power and authority and to the glory of God. And this is what modern theologians are saying is like the essence of the Christian life is to be in that ever-present presence of God before God. That's what we're supposed to get to, guys. We're supposed to get to a place where that's exciting, But I think what happens for a lot of Christians is we, we like separate our life into two areas. You know, like there's the Sunday morning church life area and then there's the area of my life I don't want God to see. Or maybe it's the area of your life you don't want God to have authority over. You know, this is, the, this is what area of life Christians live in that... Um, they probably know what they're doing is not right, it's not godly, it's not Christ-like, it's not gonna honor him, it doesn't acknowledge his authority. Maybe it's the part that you hide, you're ashamed of, you're embarrassed of. It's the area where you know what you're about to do is wrong, but you do it anyway. And what this Coram Deo concept of the Christian life means is that there's no such thing as two areas of a Christian's life, that either all of your life is Christian or none of it is. When we read, God's word, we, we keep seeing God trying to keep his people from sin. In fact, that's like Leviticus, basically. It, Leviticus just makes this concept of God wanting his people to avoid sin. Leviticus makes it so obvious. I mean, the, the sacrifices all throughout Leviticus take center stage as death is required to cover over the sin of the guilty in fact, it's like Leviticus is the book of blood. I mean, I hate to say it that way, but it is. It's like there's blood everywhere. I mean, the book starts out, blood, 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 blood on the altar, blood on the horns, blood on the items, blood on the tops, the sides, and the, and the every, I mean, all around the, the, the articles of the tabernacle, blood on the utensils that cause the sacrifice, blood on the hands of those involved in the sacrifice, blood splattered on the clothing of the priests who were involved in the sacrifice, blood on the worshiper who would bring the sacrifice in order to perform the sacrifice, blood everywhere, blood. I mean, it even starts out, the whole book of Leviticus starts out with a sacrifice. 
I mean, like races to a sacrifice. And so in Leviticus chapter 1, if you've got your Bible, this is a bit of a reminder. We've covered this before. If you're new to us, then this might be like the first time you've ever heard it. But Leviticus 1 verse 3, I'm just going to read verse 3 and 4, and then I want to pray again and pray that we can pack a ton into a small amount of time. Y'all believe that, right? We will be out of here early. Verse 3 says this, If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer it. A male without defect. Defect Without defect means spotless, perfect, pure. He shall offer it at the doorway of the tent of meeting, that he may be accepted before the Lord He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering that it may be accepted for him to make atonement on his behalf. All right, let's pray. Father, we do love you and we're so grateful that you've gotten us to this point and we praise you, Lord, that you race after those so many in the world avoid and you chase after those who run from you. And God, it's because of your love And you, Lord, came up with the ways that we can be right before you because you want us to have peace with you. So God, as we go through this passage and go through this this celebration that we call Lord's Supper or communion, God, I ask that you would help us to fully grasp what's happening. In Jesus we pray, amen. Y'all can be seated. So as Leviticus is making it clear, I mean, it starts out with this burnt offering already. It says, if his offering, so the worshiper bringing a burnt offering from the herd, shall offer it, a male without defect, offered at the doorway of the tent of meeting, it says that he may be accepted before the Lord. And I feel like I have so many things that I just want to write and show you guys. It's so cool it's happening. So like in verse 3, if his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer it without defect. Flawlessness was required, had to be perfect. He shall offer it at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Before you even come before God, before you just approaching God, the sacrifice comes first. And then it says that you may be accepted before God. This burnt offering, he called it, is all about being accepted before God. You're not going to just walk up to God without that offering having taken place because of sin. And the blood had to take place so that we could come before God. And there's another sacrifice. Chapter 3 even gives us another sacrifice where, uh, let's see, chapter 3, yeah. It says, now if his offering is a sacrifice of peace offerings, if he's going to offer out of the herd without male or fem- uh, whether male or female, he shall offer it without defect before the Lord. The peace offering followed the burnt offering. The peace offering followed the burnt offering, and, 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 and there's a reason for that. Now, here's, here's, here's kind of what I want to get across today as we're walking towards the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Um, do you ever see those movies that, like, the opening scene is some big, exciting scene, Right? But you don't have a clue why we're seeing this scene. It's like all of a sudden, the movie starts and you're watching something, and it's interesting to look at, right? And then the scene comes to a close, and the screen goes black, and then on the bottom of the screen, it will say, six months earlier. You know what I'm talking about? Like those movies that, like, they're going to show you the end at the beginning, but the end that they show at the beginning doesn't make any sense unless you see the end, which is actually the beginning. Is that clear? You know what I'm talking about? Like you see a movie, and it's like six months earlier. And like the only way that you're going to make any sense of what's going on is if you've got to see what's happening, and what's happening later is actually what happened way earlier. Okay, well, this is how so many Christians live their life. We live our life. so many Christians live their life. Maybe you live your life like with this opening scene Christianity, and then you don't look at the rest of the, of the point, so you don't know what happened earlier. And so your life, instead of being this life filled with excitement about the grace and mercy of God, Instead, your life is like this big question mark that never gets answered. And that opening scene that you first learned is like all that you know, and so you kind of go, this doesn't make any sense. Okay, well, that's what we're trying to achieve. I mean, how many of you have taken Lord's Supper or communion or Eucharist, whichever you call it, and you're not really sure why? 
Like you hear the guy up front go, this is the blood, this is the body, and you're like, yeah. I mean, when Jesus first said to his followers, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me, it said many left him that day. Right, so they weren't filled with faith. They weren't connecting any dots. They were like, nope, uh, God said don't consume flesh or blood, so we're out. You're trying to make us into a cannibal. And they, they accused him of cannibalism. The burnt offering, chapter one, guys, was so that you could be accepted in the eyes of God. And you needed to be accepted through an offering because of sin. And the thing that we, I think, forget or don't realize is every sin is a capital punishment, capital offense sin. Because you have sinned against an eternally holy, perfect God. So your sin against an eternal God is like an eternal sin with eternal consequences. I mean, you and I sin against each other. We're not eternal. So our punishment's temporary, basically. God's eternal. So his punishment becomes permanent. So everyone's guilty of sin. That means there's this eternal death required. That's what the Bible tells us. The wages of sin is death. So God created this sacrificial system, and Leviticus starts out, chapter one, none of you are accepted by God. If you want to be accepted by God, either you're going to have to have, well, the punishment of death, or you're going to have to have an innocent, something innocent to shed its blood, to lose its life for you so that you can come in my presence. So that was chapter one. Chapter three is like people realizing now they're accepted by God because of the blood of an innocent animal. Well, now they're so excited that they have peace with God that there's this other sacrifice called the peace offering or the peace sacrifice. It's the word korban in the uh, Hebrew language. Korban means offering. Korban means sacrifice. And so they're going, we have made this offering now. You've allowed us to be accepted in your presence. But even more than that, we're so excited to be at peace with you that we're going to give everything we have in celebration and praise and excitement. Now, here's what's crazy. The burnt offering... Every bit of it went to God. They'd kill the animal. The person who brought the uh, animal would do the killing himself, and it said he'd place his hand on the head. You may remember when we went over this back in January that it says he was like leaning and holding on firmly to that animal as he would slice the throat of it, blood pouring out. It's a graphic, bloody, nasty uh, scene. And then, then chapter 3, so chapter 1, that burnt offering, all of the animal goes on the altar. All of it gets consumed by God. That's what the smoke represents as it rises up in Leviticus. In the, chat, in the third chapter we just read of the peace offering, that's, that's, it's a very different offering. Some went to God, and then the worshiper also consumed some of it. And then everybody else who was in the tabernacle vicinity, everybody else who was there would also take part in the sacrifice. It became this like, like, like meal, like this, uh, like this, I don't know, festival almost, where they're going, hey, everybody, I'm so excited to be at peace with God that I'm taking what I've got that's so great. I'm taking the best of what I've got, and I'm sharing it with everybody. So you're seeing this incredible generosity. I mean, massive generosity, this flawless animal that everyone can benefit from. You're seeing this great big feast right there. Burnt offering, only God. Peace offering, everyone celebrates. And this is really cool image that you're already seeing where the burnt offering satisfies my sin debt individually. The peace offering gathers us together to celebrate it together. Does that make sense? So the burnt offering, individual sin covered. Peace offering, all together we celebrate. When Jesus was gathered with his disciples, that last night at that last supper, he's talking to them about his blood and his flesh he's talking about the cup. He even talks about the bread and the cup and the wine is my blood and the bread is my flesh, my body. He wasn't inventing something new. He was directing everyone back to Leviticus. And what he was trying to show them is that the roots of the Christian faith go way back into the history of Israel. So, the sacrificial system, it allowed people to have their sin covered by the blood of an animal. It's interesting. The book of Hebrews in the New Testament picks up a little bit on this. and It says in Hebrews 9, verse 22, it says, according to the law, 
You know what the law is when it talks about it in the New Testament? If it says law in the New Testament, it's referring to the Old Testament, right? So according to the Old Testament, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood. You got two things there, cleansing and blood. The New Testament is still drawing our attention to the blood of the Old Testament, saying that it's cleansed, and without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Now, we have like three things culminating in this one little verse. You've got the New Testament pointing back to the Old Testament. You've also got it reminding all of us about the importance of blood. Then it says there's no forgiveness. What's fascinating, though, is in the Old Testament, it said that the shedding of the blood of animals was what covered over our sins. So remember that, because we've got to come back to it to make better sense of what's happening in the Lord, in the Lord's Supper. So he's saying that. And again, if you're thinking, okay, Brian, all this is a review. Why am I explaining it? Okay, let me explain why I'm explaining. All right? How about that? I don't want us to see every chapter as its own little thing. I do my best to make every sermon where it could stand on its own, but really, man, all of the Bible fits together like this fantastic picture, right? So I'm going, let's connect chapter one and chapter three, and for that matter, all of Leviticus. Let's connect all of that with why they came out of Exodus so that they could worship, and then connect all of that with what's happening in the New Testament, and connect all of that with why Jesus said, this is what you're supposed to do when you gather to celebrate this Lord's Supper. I don't want us just walking in here grabbing the combo pack going, oh, that's convenient, you know, and thinking like that's the whole story, man. There's so much more for us to grasp. Otherwise, we watch that opening scene of our Christian life, and it says six months later, and we just turn it off. And here's part of the problem is there are people in the Christian world who seem to encourage us to turn it off, not to go back and see the rest of the story that happened so much earlier that makes that opening scene so important. I'm really having fun with this opening scene illustration. Can you tell? Because I feel like it makes such a great relation to what's happened. Why so many people are like, I don't read Leviticus. I don't read the Old Testament. I don't read any of that. Just focus on the New Testament. Right? Well, you're an opening scene Christian. Right? And it's not going to have the power or the depth. I think what happens too is like you live out your life just incomplete. You live out your Christianity just incomplete. And the, the great meaning and purpose and beauty of the Christian life is just that permanent blank that doesn't get filled in and that's what i think lord's supper is that's what i think that's what i think happens to a lot of christians is they celebrate they go to church they hear the message the music lord's supper is kind of tacked on at the end and it's like that's just what we do and then christianity is just a hobby right and then the world doesn't take us serious because they just think the christian faith is just a hobby get a new hobby right like why are you christians so serious about these things why are you Christians, why do you care about abortion? You know, why do you Christians care about who marries who? Why do, why do you care, Christians, about attraction? Or who lives with who, or if they're married or not? Like, why do you Christians care? I mean, a lot of the reason is the world has no idea, because most Christians have no idea. Right? Is this stinging at all? Right? Yeah, it does, man. It stings to me. I mean... So what was meant to be this powerful reminder, the Lord's Supper, it just, be, it just it remains a question mark. And you know what happens? If the, if the Lord's Supper is a question mark to you, then when we gather for Lord's Supper, it begins to feel like depressing and sad. Like the Lord's Supper is just to remind us of our guilt. And the Lord's Supper is just to remind us of our sin. And then it becomes so depressing that like Lord's Supper is just like the Lord's funeral. Like every time. It's just boring and sad. And like depressing, and who wants to be a part of that? And it wasn't even the whole reason that we were told to, to, to celebrate the Lord's Supper. So remember how the Leviticus passage, remember how it says the blood of animals covered over sin? Well, the covering by the blood of animals left people in this constant state of needing forgiveness. It, it's, the sinner wasn't made sinless. They were still the individual who brought the animal for the sacrifice was still imperfect. Like the animal was more perfect, it seemed like. They they were innocent. We weren't. And that's where Hebrews 10, 1 tries to explain this. So we're still in Hebrews again, and it says this in Hebrews 10, 1. It should be on the screen behind me. It says, for the law, since it only, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make perfect those who draw near. The law 
And, and when it talks about the law and sacrifice, it's talking about Leviticus. Still, it's pointing back to Leviticus. It's saying, watch the rest of the story so you can see what happened earlier. It has only a shadow. A shadow looks like the thing that it represents, but it's not the thing. Right, So this shadow of me behind me, that's not me behind me. This is me. The shadow just is like this is like the outline of Brian. You know, so it like represents, but it's not the same. So he's saying the law, all the sacrificial system, it was a shadow of the good things to come, meaning the Levitical system was pointing to Jesus yet to come and not the very form of things, not Jesus himself, not the perfection itself, but, but, the, but the concept, like a shadow. And the same sacrifices can never make perfect what, that's telling us God's goal for you and me is to be made perfect. Just like, just like Jesus was perfect, sinless, flawless, right? I mean, he lived a sinless life, just like the animal was sinless, flawless, without defect. God is wanting us to be holy, perfect. He's what he wants. Well, apparently that Old Testament system couldn't make us perfect. Jesus does, and it makes perfect those who draw near. So that's what you see already happening in, in 10.1. A few verses later in Hebrews 10.4, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. We're seeing it again. It's always been impossible for the blood of these animals to take away the sins. The blood of the animals can cover the sin, but it can't take it away. Do you see what I'm saying here? This is why it was so powerful when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming down to get baptized. Do you remember that? John the Baptist, what did he say to Jesus? Behold, the Lamb of God who does what? takes away the sins of the world. Not just the Lamb of God who covers over the sins. And here's what's even more important. I mean, I'm already getting excited, I got goosebumps. The sacrificial system was for Israel. John the Baptist didn't just say, oh, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of Israel. He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Wow, so that everybody now can come to God, be accepted in his sight, be at peace with God because of what Jesus has done and his perfect blood that takes away our sins. See, the animals just covered over it. We're okay for now, we're still guilty, we're still not perfect. Jesus, we come to him by faith. Doesn't matter if you're a Jew, doesn't even matter if you've got your full faculties about you. You come to Jesus in faith, even having just that opening scene understanding going, oh, I'm so so glad that I can be made right with God. Pretty cool story, isn't it? Man, you got to see the rest of the story for that opening scene to make sense. So in the Lord's Supper, Jesus is like, unless you consume my blood. I mean, when the animal was brought for sacrifice. The animal was paying what we owed, and then we went about our life. Jesus is like, don't, don't go anywhere. Right, I mean, this is what's so cool about the Lord's Supper. Like, we don't come to God bringing the blood. Hey God, we're giving our gift of blood to you. It's the opposite. It's God saying, I'm bringing to you blood. The Lord's Supper, it's, it's a gift from God to us. He brought the blood of Christ to us, not just to cover, but to take away, and not just to satisfy, but to make perfect. And so Jesus is like, don't just come and consume and then leave. Come and celebrate and take me into yourself. I want to be one with you. And none of the earlier followers, none of them drank his blood. They understood. I mean, he even said, in this cup is my blood, and it was wine. That's a really cool verse, too. Man, I was going to not show it, but I feel like I need to. <clears throat> Here it is. Okay, this is really cool, and then we're going to do Lord's Supper. See when Jesus said, it's going to be on the screen, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five. In the same way, he took the cup, as Jesus took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Okay, this is such a powerful verse that Jesus is making to all of his apostles that this is like the story all comes together. And that opening scene becomes powerful. Because you remember where we got the whole concept of the sacrificial system? It was in the law. 
right? And that law is called the Old Testament. The word for testament is covenants, the same word. In the Greek, it's diatheke. So the word for new is kine, and then the new covenant is diatheke. So kine diatheke. So that's, that's what it is. Now, here's what's really cool about it. Jesus is saying, you're aware of the law. The law showed you how guilty you are. The law showed you how often you got to keep bringing these sacrifices to me. Well, here in this cup with this wine that represents my blood, this, this cup becomes the container of the new covenant with me. Here's what's so cool. So this new covenant is the exact same translation as New Testament. All right, so kind adiotheke is the New Testament, the new covenant. So he's saying in, in this, all of this, this is all contained in what you and I've got now in the New Testament. So what are we saying? All of the New Testament is fulfilling, explaining, and making clear what the Old Testament was pointing to. The Old Testament filled with shadows pointing to the coming Christ. Jesus shows up and goes, there's this New Testament with God. There's this new covenant with God. There's a new relationship that's found by faith in me because I came to take away the sins of the world. And as you celebrate by faith and you take part in that Lord's Supper, man, we're seeing how now the wrath and judgment of God is done away with and it turns into mercy and grace of God because of the blood of the Son of God. You see that? How powerful is that? So by that cup, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as you often, as you do this, as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus wasn't creating a new thing. He was pointing back to the old thing and saying, now this opening scene will make sense. I'm here to fulfill that Old Testament. I'm here to fulfill the sacrificial system. And by faith, there's there's no more judgment, there's no more wrath, because I've come to take away the sin of the world. So now, when we take the Lord's Supper now, I want us to take it, you know, the importance of our sin being covered by the blood of Christ is obviously incredibly important. But it's not just a thing for us to remember what God has done. It's a thing for us to celebrate what he's done. This gift to us where God comes to you by the blood of Christ. So everyone, when you walked in, you got this, I assume. If you didn't, just sort of raise your hand. They'll bring it to you. Now, um, if you're not a follower of Jesus, don't do this. Right? The Bible is also clear in the New Testament. If you try to come and take Lord's Supper and you're not right with God, then you're, you're, you're consuming judgment onto yourself. Let's not do that. And so if you don't take Lord's Supper, it's very respectful. It's very respectful for you to say, I'm not in a place where I need to be taking Lord's Supper. There's unconfessed sin in my life. I'm not a follower of Christ. These types of things. And it shows that you're taking God serious. And for the rest of us, Those of you who are followers of Christ, you approach by the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God. And because he took away your sins, and by faith in him, you're made whole and perfect. That's how we're able to come to him now in in remembrance of what he did for us. And so we're gonna take, you want bread to the top. We're gonna do bread first, so bread. Take the top off. And why don't you just grab that piece of bread, just hold on to it, and have a moment of prayer right now between you and God, reflecting on what what your sin cost and reflecting on what Christ gave. Father, we love you and we're so grateful for what you've done for us, as we sang a moment ago. God, we're so grateful for the sacrifice of Christ for our sin, not just to cover, but to take away. And now, Lord, as we celebrate and we remember, we're so grateful that by the blood of Christ, our sin has been removed individually. And now we have peace with you and we can celebrate together collectively. So thank you, God, for the cross. In Jesus we pray, amen.
want you to do the same thing. You can take the cover off. There. Father, we're thankful for the blood of your son Jesus that was shed for us. And God, by his blood, our sins are taken away. By his wounds we are healed, your word says. And God, it's serious and it's celebratory at the same time. We're so thankful for forgiveness, for all the stuff we're guilty of. And Lord, as we receive this now, we do so remembering the blood that was shed for us. And we praise you. In Jesus we pray. Amen.